So now you will um, be left with Martin Wolfarter, who is now uh, regulatory affairs at Copert in Netherlands, but that's not with this hat that he's coming. He's coming because he used to be the manager of Antumon Technology in South Africa. So he was hired to manage the facility and the program once they, they decided to go from uh, research to semi-commercial. And the program was started by a grower association. So that's quite an interesting story. Thank you, Clelia. Yes, so uh, I tend to change hats quite often, which sometimes puts me in a predicament where, where, where do I actually stand? Um, but uh, let me see. This works. Okay, let's uh, delve, oops, delve right into it. Um, this project, Intermont Technologies, was started by a growers association, SAPA, that, um, this is a growers association here, this one, and that uh, is held by the holding company Hortgrow Services. And Hortgrow Services is connected with the University of Stellenbosch for main research, and then through a bunch of other players, we were connected to the IAEA, where we gained a lot of resources from. So, um, technical description, what did we do? Um, first of all, we started with monitoring. Monitoring the resident pest populations in orchards, particularly apple and pear orchards, where codling moth, the pest that we targeted, was the main culprit. Um, then, through years of R&D, um, proof of concept, at least on a small scale, on about one hectare, then 10 hectares uh, for SIT on codling moth was done. Uh, this was modeled on the research that was previously done in Canada, um, British Columbia, particularly at Oxia. And uh, when there was sufficient evidence of this, the Growers Association decided to provide funding for a mass rearing facility and expand. Um, but this is where things went wrong. Because upscaling from 10 hectares to ambitious 1,000 hectares uh, comes with a lot of challenges that were completely unforeseen. The most biggest challenge, or the biggest one, was the fact that the grower was never asked what he actually needs. And that is the core of the problem here. You have a growers association that represents growers' needs, but an individual grower's needs sometimes differ significantly from the collective of an association. And that kind of change moves over time, so you need to really be aware of how that changes. Um, and then when other measures come in, new pesticides come in, these things change rather quickly. Whereas a growers association that has now put forward a lot of money cannot immediately change. Um, so that kind of staying up to date with needs um, is a really, really important part. Um, so yeah, we uh, eventually uh, were successful at producing codling moth. We released them. So that's, this is what's monitoring what the population was, producing, releasing, and then showing the data where we did release and also how successful we were or not. Our target pest is codling moth, Cydia pulmonella. And I uh, borrowed this picture from uh, the FAO IAEA book on codling moth uh, SIT. Um, and as you can see there on apple and on pears, uh, codling moth would lay an egg on the skin of the fruit, the larvae would bore into the core, eat the core of the fruit, and that fruit is obviously unsellable. Our process, how Intermon did this, we had a mass rearing of egg production onto wax paper sheets, these were washed, these were put on an artificial diet, in over 28 days we reared these codling moth larvae, um, they pupated and the emerging adult moss uh, we're flying around in a room and there's a little pink light there, that's a UV light, with a huge extractor at the back, a cyclonic separator, where they were collected. And this is what a typical collection looked like. They were cooled so they wouldn't move and mate and scratch and kill each other. Then they were irradiated with a, a gamma irradiation source. They were cool transported to the farm and they were released from ATVs. And this, this was a basic process. In order to maintain colony fitness, on a regular basis we would go to wild orchards, neglected orchards, organic orchards, and recollect uh, codling moth from the field and reintroduce them into the colony. 
Um, this is easier said than done, because when you take something from the wild and put it in an artificial environment, most of it dies. Uh, the success rate here typically was about 5%. And then, of course, you have the danger of bringing pathogens, uh, tigger gramma wasps. So it was, this, was, this was a tricky process to make sure that we don't kill our, our colony or our production. So in, in, in quick, this is how we reared our moss. Where was this done? South Africa. Um, we focused on the Western Cape province and particularly um, three growing regions. So the star at Stellenbosch, this is where the facility was, um, connected to the University of Stellenbosch. Um, and then we, uh, we released, oh, I think I lost the laser pointer. We released yeah, uh, Prince Alfred Hamlet, the Sirius uh, Varam Bockefeld area. This is at an altitude of just about a thousand meters. Uh, we also released in uh, the Gerbo region here at the bottom. This is at an altitude of about 350 meters. And then in a secluded valley at about 500 meters altitude. Uh, close to Worcester. So we had three growing regions, which also meant we could compare data between these regions. Um, typically, our orchards were very uniform, in South African terms, pristine apple pear orchards. Um, in most cases, there is also a green strip that is managed. Uh, what you see here is mostly grass, because this also gets mowed down regularly. But uh, specifically in spring, there would be quite a floral uh, base in, in this green strip. Nowadays, um, there's much more effort put into managing these strips successfully with a mix of uh, seed, well, flowers and everything, to make sure that there is a, a habitat for, for predators and parasitoids. Um, and typically, this would be the, the data we generated. So all the red lines represent the tracks that my staff would ride to release the moth. The areas not covered would, would not be orchards, um, field crops that uh, were not subject to uh, coddling moth damage. Um, typically, this total area is about 200 hectares, and all of this was released by two guys on quad bikes in one day. They would repeat this uh, a second time during the week, so we had two releases a week of 1,000 moths per hectare uh, at a go to release about 2,000 moths a hectare to have a good overflooding ratio. Um, where we saw uh, elevated pest populations, we obviously increased, increased that flooding ratio. We usually aimed for a 1 to 10 uh, ratio, or 10 to 1. Um, when we look at the, the value propositions, I will quickly touch on the, the network first, because I actually didn't use the, the pictures and the follow-up slides, but how we were structured. Uh, SAPA was the main sponsor, the Growers Association, that used Hort Growers Services who was a connector to Intermon, the business, and to the university. The university also partnered with the ARC, which is a governmental uh, research institution, which had direct links to the Department of Agriculture, who had direct links to NEXA, which is the nuclear energy provider, who we needed for nuclear safety matters on the radiation source, and who had connection with the IAEA. So you can see there was quite a significant network of partners and players that helped make it possible for us, a private company, to use resources from government. The value proposition, um, coddling moth management on a long-term basis. That was what we were aiming for. And for that, we did monitoring in order to show the grower what the problem was and how we addressed it and how, in time, uh, we managed to succeed and reduce uh, pest populations. Um, obviously, the question then from a grower side is, yeah, but did you really monitor correctly? So we often had growers monitoring on their own side, which also was, also was a good thing because then we could compare data, our data with grower data, and where there was a discrepancy, we could address it uh, immediately. Um, in order to reach this value proposition, um, or also part of it, uh, th the main point was to look at early season control because the more we control populations early, the less we had a second and a third generation. And the third generation in this case was the one that would be overwintering to the next season. Um, and we, I think we were rather successful in, in bringing the population down, particularly uh, towards the second and third. Um, Obviously, by doing this, we managed to reduce reliance on conventional pesticides, which was the main aim for the growers. A, because of cost of conventionals, 
And when I say conventions, I mean both generics and the multinational products, but also because of a residue problem. Um, South Africa was faced with a situation that for all export fruit, you couldn't have more than three to four residues on the crop. And when I say residues, these would be within the MRL. Um, so the, the quickest way of achieving this was by reducing the, the pesticide residues. And it, in this case, the, the products that would be, would typically would be used for coiling moth control. Um, and then, of course, also a major point, which is actually where this program started, was uh, resistance management. In the 80s, South Africa was faced with huge resistance against conventional products. Then new chemistry came in. But during those uh, years, in the 80s, a lot of research was done on SIT. Then in the 90s, we had good control. Towards the end of the 90s, we had resistance again, and SIT, the topic came up again. But now we also had information from Canada, how successful they were. And this is how the, um, the program was also then sold to growers. And we will be able to curb or at least slow down resistance development and the chemistry that you're using will be reliable and usable for a longer time. Um, and of course, lower pesticide exposure, better marketability uh, of fruit. Um, and this was particularly important as during the early 2000s, well, even mid-2000s, South Africa was again expanding quite significantly into the European market. Um, and then we intended to focus further on advisory service, looking at a larger IPM program, based on the fact that we could re reduce the pesticide need for um, codling moth. We could also look at possibly reducing other insecticides. And uh, that was the... the that would have been 2.0 for Entomon. Um, delivery uh, was based from a co private company. Ooh, five minutes. Um, value network, as I pointed out the slide earlier, uh, we had a lot of players. Um, and as you can see them here listed again, SARPA, the Growers Association, the University of Stellenbosch for R&D, the Agricultural Research Council for R&D, and also they were the owner of the, the radiation source. Um, the Department of Science and Technology that helped us with uh, expert missions, um, NEXA, the Energy Corporation, IAEA. I myself was on three expert missions to Guatemala, to Mexico, to learn from the fruit fly facilities there and bring that technology, that, that idea back to South Africa. And then, obviously, uh, uh, other associations, non-monetary contributions. We had significant support from the media, that uh, always wanted to know, you know, what's the next best thing we're doing and how we're going to do that. And incidentally, the use of irradiation and the nuclear source was never a, a threat in, in terms of media uh, in public opinion. Um, contributions, gains, levers, what did we achieve? Obviously, seeing that run down an orchard less uh, and not having that damage, but having these kind of clean fruits. Um, as I mentioned, we were a for-profit company. We had no statutory support, unlike um, SIT Africa, which is a fruit fly facility. Uh, Hortcrow Services helped us um, being the facilitator for the funding we received from SAPA, um, or the initial start of funding. And then with regards to human resources, we gained those basically from the open uh, job market. Uh, what did we deliver? Well, we did manage to produce. First, it looked like this, a lot of fungal contamination, and towards the end, our diet looked like this. So, a lot of learning, proof of concept certainly was achieved. We were able to mass rear, not according to the schedule that initially was pointed out in the business plan. Um, we certainly showed a reduction of moth damage, and I'll show you a slide of our results just now. Uh, we managed to re reduce dependency on PPPs, uh, and we had a greater uptake on biocontrol in general. Um, but also, very importantly, we acted as an incubator for other technology at the University of Stellenbosch because we made access possible to, to uh, larvae of uh, codling moth, which could be used for um, EPN work, EPF work. Uh, just quickly, results. Um, the first results here up into uh, 2010, these were during the R&D phase. Um, and you can see a reduction, so based on this reduction, and the pointer is not working anymore, we uh, obviously initiated the semi-commercialization phase. Um, then 2010, when we had the startup, we had a blip in production, we couldn't supply, and we had this 
the sudden rise in damage. Um, then the red, you can see there's, it looks like a significant rise, but the red region only came in during 2012. But from 2010 to 2013, and I don't have 2014 data here, there again was a significant reduction in damage based on SAT releases. Um, yeah, running out of time. Uh, developmental levers, um, again, I pointed this out already in terms of resistance development, where we came from. Uh, international collaboration with Oxia was paramount in learning and helping us set up the business. Uh, High-level collaboration with the IEA was paramount, and then also further research with uh, University of Stellenbosch and ARC. Uh, business failures, why did we fail? We were too over-optimistic of, of what we would achieve within uh, a year, two years uh, scaling up. Uh, a weak business plan that made no room for error. So uh, when you can't deliver, first of all, you lose your customer and you don't have the money of that year. So how are you going to pay for the next year? Uh, and no, it sounds bizarre, but yes, that was not taken in the into the business plan. Facilities design, when you design a facility, you're going to redesign it the next year, you're going to redesign it for the next two, three, four, five years. Uh, don't think that the first technology you settle on or settle with will be the final technology and make a provision for that financially. Um, also, uh, lack of cost competitiveness. Uh, we had a huge expense in terms of agar that was part of our diet and also unwilling partners um, at some point. Um, and second last slide, developmental risk. Um, yeah, misaligned with customer needs. Although this was initiated from a growers association uh, and the growers association, association thought they knew where they were going, when new chemistry again became available for the third time, there was a cost saving for the growers and everybody just hopped onto that bandwagon and suddenly SIT wasn't needed. So there was not that long-term bridging thinking of how can we maintain the business. Uh, our pricing model was wrong. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, timing, uh, misalignment, bad scheduling, uh, starting up right in the beginning of the season but not having a sufficient buffer to actually start releasing, that was a major uh, problem. Uh, and yeah, if you miss a target, if you miss the market, you have, it has a direct financial impact because you don't get the money for that season when you are privately funded. And uh, that was my last slide. So a quick thank you to all the organizations that were involved, as you can see up there. Um, and uh, yeah, any questions? And how is the, the company right now? It doesn't exist anymore. We uh, closed it down end of 2014. Uh, that left the university and our shareholder with a, a facility that was custom made at, at that point in time, 15 million rands investment, which in terms of euros is not a, m a lot. That's only 750,000 euros. But rand terms, it is a huge investment. So it stood dormant for three years which is not a good thing for any air conditioning system. Uh, yeah, for, for no system, it's good to stand dormant. Uh, eventually, uh, SAPA, the main shareholder, sold the facility back to the university, who completely revamped it. They chucked out all the technology. Everything that was custom built was scrapped. Um, and they now use that same building for R&D purposes. But uh, the SIT program on Codlingmouth in South Africa is no more. But there's again a need. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was just wondering if there are other EPM strategies going on that could be incompatible with CIT, like uh, mating disruption. Um, so we, didn't, we never considered mating disruption incompatible. First of all, mating disruption in South Africa is considered the backbone of, of any lepidopteran control. Um, Yes, obviously the release moths are going to be as subjected to the mating disruption as the wild ones, but if you have such a situation where both the wild and the, the sterile are subject to the same, and you're still overstocking with sterile's, 
the odds are that that moth that eventually still finds a female will still be the sterile moth. So um, I think the efficiency remains the same if the flooding ratio is the same. Um, and the intention is to have no, no progeny. And that's what you achieve. You have mating disruption that makes it difficult. And if there's still any mating, it is still with a wild one. So I have just a small question. Among all the reasons that you mentioned behind failure, what, is, what was the factor that contributed the most to this failure? Again, the misalignment with the customer need. So again, the growth re association is a good uh, representation of the average customer need. But it was also highly influenced by certain researchers that wanted to continue promoting their research projects, which were based on SIT. So the influence in the growth association uh, from R&D side and from proponents for the technology was greater than the influence of the customer, which is the grower. Um, so it sounds bizarre, but be careful with a growth association that is not representative. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>